Good morning, everyone. My name is Brady Witten, and it's my privilege to welcome you to online worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge. So it's still Easter. Uh, in the church, we celebrate Easter for a, a season that is 50 days long, and it ends with the celebration of Pentecost, which is on May 31st. And the reason the season is this long is that the scriptures tell us that for 40 days, Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection, giving them convincing proof of his, his, that he had been raised from the dead and teaching them about the kingdom of God. And so uh, we still need to at least one more time continue with our Easter greeting. And so uh, the way it goes is I'm going to say to you, Christ is risen, and you respond, he is risen indeed. I say, Christ is risen. You say, he is risen indeed. And we end with a hallelujah. So let's give this uh, one more Easter, Easter go. Ready? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Will you pray with me? Resurrected Lord, as you blew your spirit upon the disciples long ago, we welcome you to blow your spirit upon us. Lord, fill every word, every action, every thought with your grace, with your presence. Lord, give us your peace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me in the prayer for illumination, which you'll find on your screen? Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Easter is not over. It's not over. Uh, in today's reading, we pick up the Easter story on the evening of Jesus' resurrection. So uh, he's been raised on Easter morning. The tomb is empty. And in John's telling, he has appeared to Mary Magdalene. But Mary is the only person that he's appeared to. And it's now later in the day, it's in the evening, John tells us, and the disciples are locked inside because they're afraid, they're worried. You see, the Jewish leaders had just turned their teacher over to the Romans to be executed, and they were afraid that the same thing might happen to them. Uh, now, this, this reading, we often focus on Thomas and Thomas's doubt. But when I was reading it this week, something else jumped out at me that I want us to, to chase a little bit, and it's this. The disciples are locked in a room. 
They're afraid to go out because something bad might happen to them. <laughs> Think about that a second. They're afraid to go out because something bad might happen to them. And I just, I just have to wonder, can any of you relate to this? Can, can you relate to this fear or this anxiety? Now listen, I know a lot of people uh, who, who say, well, I'm not, I'm not feeling anxious. I'm not, I'm not worried. I'm, I've got all, you know, I think things are fine with me. Uh, now you may not be experiencing anxiety and fear in, uh, in ways that you might call anxiety and fear. But let me ask you this. Have you found yourself being a little testy maybe recently? I could think of a few times where I've been a little testy with Tasha and with my kids. Uh, have you been doing a little more stress eating or stress drinking than maybe you, you normally do? I've heard a lot of people comment how they're having trouble sleeping right now. And uh, again, amazingly, the number of people who've told me they're having strange dreams, really kind of vivid and strange dreams. Uh, or maybe you're, you're uh, finding yourself a little forgetful, right? And so again, you may not be anxious or worried in some of the traditional ways that you think about it, but I think every person on our planet right now is feeling a little bit of anxiety and stress from the situation that we find ourselves in. A Vanderbilt University professor named Bruce Compass says that COVID-19 uh, causes stress uh, for three reasons in particular. And he said these are all pretty major, major stressors for people. First of all, it's unpredictable. Uh, we didn't see it coming and we can't predict when it will end. That's, that's where I find my mind going a lot now. When, when's this going to end? When's it, when are we going to be able to return to normal? What's it going to be like? But it's, it's unpredictable. It's also uncontrollable. So short of uh, washing our hands, wearing masks, practicing social distancing, doing those things that we can do, we really don't have control over this virus, how it spreads, who, who gets infected by it, where it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's uncontrollable. And finally, it's chronic. Uh, this has been going on for a while, and it looks like it might be going on for a while longer. I mentioned this is our sixth Sunday that we haven't been able to gather get together at our church for worship, and it looks like uh, it's, it's going to be a, a while longer. So unpredictable, uncontrollable, and chronic. And all of this uh, makes us feel vulnerable, and we don't like to feel vulnerable, right? When Jesus appears to the disciples, they find themselves in a similar period of anxiety and fear. And yet, I love the very, very first thing that Jesus says when he appears to the disciples. Did you catch what it was? The very first thing he says is, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now, I think uh, there's probably a couple of reasons why Jesus said this. First of all, it had to scare them a little bit, right? I mean, they're standing in a locked room. Uh, they think that Jesus is dead, and then suddenly he appears there right before them. And I would have been a little startled, right? And so uh, I think that's one of the reasons Jesus says, peace, it's, it's okay, peace be with you, right? But I also think that Jesus knew about their spiritual state. He knew that they were worried. He knew that they were afraid. If we look back in Jesus' earlier teachings before his crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus actually has quite a bit to say to his disciples about worry. Uh, the word worry or worrying occurs in the NIV translation of the New Testament 14 times. And every single time it happens, it's used by Jesus. And every time what he tells us about worry is, don't do it. Don't worry. Uh, in Matthew 6, 27, Jesus actually says to us, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And you all know the answer to that, right? The answer is no, you can't. And actually, worry robs us of life, right? It causes physical problems. It causes emotional problems. Someone once described worry as gathering bundles of sticks to build a bridge that you're never going to have to cross. And I, I love that image, right? Because wor worries like that a little bit, right? It goes around, it picks up all these little things. It's, it's gathering bundles of sticks to build a bridge that we're, we're never going to have to cross. <laughs> I've always loved the story about a man who's standing on a crowded bus. And while he's standing there, a young man comes up to him and says, uh, hey, what time is it? And the man refuses to answer him. And the, the young man kind of dejected, goes away and tries to find somebody else who will tell him the time. Well, this man's friend says to him, uh, why were you so rude to that young man? I mean, all he was doing was asking the time. And he says, yeah, he says, but if I'd given him the time, then he might have started, uh, struck up a conversation with me and we might have started talking about our common interests. And then, and then maybe we would have figured out that we, we had liked each other. And if we figured out we liked each other, he might have invited himself to come over to my house for dinner. 
And if he came over my house for dinner, he would have met my beautiful daughter. And he and my beautiful daughter surely would have fallen in love. And eventually they would have gotten married. He said, and I don't want my daughter marrying somebody who can't afford a watch. Right? That's worry, right? Walter Kelly says, worry is faith in the negative. It's trust in the unpleasant. It's assurance of disaster and belief in defeat. Worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. Again, Jesus says to us, don't do it. Don't worry. Uh, Now listen, there are wise and smart things that we need to do in the face of this pandemic, right? We need to practice social distancing. We need to wash our hands. We need to wear our masks. We need to do the things, that, the wise and, and, and smart things that we're being told to do. We need to, make, need to make good choices for ourselves and for others. But we do not need to worry. Uh, and I would actually say we need to be wary of worry. Now, it's one thing to say, don't worry, right? I love when Jesus says, don't worry. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to stop ourselves from doing it. But again, Jesus gives us wise advice. In Matthew 6, as part of this teaching on worry, Jesus says this, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will fall into place. Strive first for God's kingdom and God's righteousness. I like the way that Eugene Peterson paraphrases this scripture in the message translation. He says this, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen. God will help you to deal with whatever hard things come when the time comes, right? So how do we seek God's kingdom? How do we give our entire attention to God? Now, there are a variety of things that we as Christians practice uh, to sort of tune our hearts to God's presence and God's grace. But there are some classic practices that we call the means of grace. Uh, And they are, there are six of them usually. They are worship attending worship, which I know we're not able to do personally now, but I really uh, applaud you all for taking the time to attend worship virtually in the, in the way that you can. Uh, prayer is another means of grace, another way that we seek God's kingdom and, and we seek to see, uh, to give our attention to God, prayer. Uh, Bible study is one of those things. Christian conferencing, which was really important to us as Methodists, it's getting together with other Christian people to share faith, to pray with one another, to journey with one another. And I know we can't do that in person, uh, but uh, we can do that virtually. I know a lot of groups in our church have been meeting that way. And and there are opportunities for new groups. If you go to our church's website, you'll find them there. Uh, Abstinence is one where we abstain from certain things like uh, it's fasting. So fasting from food, fasting from drink, maybe fasting from social media, different things. Uh, that that we kind of give up that have become distractions uh, to God's presence in our lives. And then the the last one is works of mercy where we do acts of goodness and and kindness for others. Uh, I want to make sure that you know that these Christian practices are not ways that we earn God's presence and grace. They're ways that we experience God's presence and God's grace. Uh, They're ways that we sensitize ourselves to God's movement in our lives and and in our world. I love this uh, uh, portion of the scripture that we read this morning where after Jesus says to the disciples, peace be with you, he breathes his Holy Spirit onto them. He says, receive my my spirit. Uh, It's like he's giving them a little piece of himself. And I think that that's what these means of grace do for us. They they help us to get get a little piece of God, a little little bit of God in our hearts and, and in our lives. So I want to say something particular about prayer this morning because I think this is a a specifically powerful practice right now while uh, many of us are isolated and while uh, we have so much worry and anxiety in our lives. John Wesley said that prayer was the grand means of drawing near to God. Uh, And he recommended that we set aside a little time in the morning and a little time in the evening for prayer. Uh, Now listen, parents, here's your chance, right? Uh, Did did you catch that? Set aside a little time, a little quiet time in the morning and in the evening for prayer. I mean, we all need our quiet. Or maybe maybe it's your spouse that you need uh, some time from, right? You have to say, honey, I have to have my prayer time now, right? And go sit down somewhere and, and take some time to pray. 
Uh, now, some, some people uh, don't really know how to pray or they wonder how to pray. I learned a very simple prayer uh, formula years ago that I, st I still use to this day, and it follows the word acts, A-C-T-S. And the A in Acts stands for adoration. And, uh, and this is when we start our prayers and we, uh, and we just sort of, uh, we, we begin to worship God and we praise God and we thank God for the gift of, of or, or we give God uh, thanks for the gift of the creation, for God's power, for God's beauty, for God's grace, for God's saving uh, work in our lives through Jesus Christ. And so it's just these words of adoration for God. Uh, the C in A-C-T-S is for confession. And uh, this is a time, I always think confession is not about beating ourselves up. Confession is about being honest before God and saying, God, here's who I am. I know you, you know who I am, but, but let, me, let me own it for you. Let me come before you in, in full honesty and full transparency and say, Lord, here's the places where I have failed to be the person of love that you've called me to be. Uh, the T in Acts is for thanksgiving. And this is a time where we intentionally give thanks to God for all of the good things in our lives. And uh, you all know, even in the midst of COVID-19, there are so many things that we can give thanks for. We can give thanks for our loved ones, for our friends. We can give thanks for the fact that uh, we have food to eat, that we have a roof over our head, that we have uh, a clothing to wear. I mean, there's so, so many different things that we can give thanks for. And the last one, ACT. S is supplication. And supplication is really just sort of a fancy word for requests. And this is where I think our worries and our fears come into play, right? We can say to God, look, here's, here's, what, I, here's what I need, God. And maybe one of the things you need is to be freed from worries and anxieties. Uh, maybe one of the things you need is to name those worries and anxieties before God, to give them to God and say, God, I, just, I, I need you to kind of take this off, off of my mind. I'll, I'll take it out of my heart, right? Help me not to worry about this. Now, if you're a real worrier, some suggest this, and I think this is a great practice. Uh, you might want to get a jar or some kind of a container and call this your worry jar, right? Your worry jar. So uh, you can see I've already got some, got some things in here. And so uh, you might imagine, let me, let me tell you, here's a, here's a funny worry that some preachers are having right now. I was meeting with a group of preachers the other day and uh, virtually meeting with them. <laughs> and uh, some of them are worried, oh no, our people are going to get used to going to worship online and they're not going to come back to church when we open the churches back up. Now, isn't that a silly thing to worry about, right? So I'm going I'm to write that down on here just as a worry that uh, uh, people coming back to church, right? Coming back to our, our fellowship and our community. So I'm going to write that as a worry on here, and I'm going to put it in my, put it in my worry jar, right? So I'm lifting this to God in prayer. I'm putting it in my worry jar. Now, here's the way this works. After you've given this uh, worry to God, after you've put it in your worry jar, if you find yourself thinking about it again, this is what you have to do. You have to go to your worry jar, you have to reach in here, and you have to find that particular worry, okay? And, and you have to pray over it again, and you say, God, all right, here it is again. God, it's, bother it's worrying me again. Lord, please help me to give up this idea that, that uh, you know, that people aren't going to come back to church, right? And, and, uh, and, and you put it back in the jar again. And it's just a reminder to you that, hey, look, I gave that worry to God, right? I gave it to God. Uh, and it's a reminder to leave it, leave it there, right? If you've got to go back and fish that thing out of there again, it's gonna, you're going to say, just leave it there. Let, let God have it, right? So I do want to ask you, what has you worried uh, what, what are you fearful about? What, what things do you find your mind sort of going out into the future, you know, sort of collecting uh, bundles of sticks, right? That you don't, you don't know what's, we don't know what's coming. What, what is it for you? And would you join me just in this, in this brief prayer? Lord, here are my worries. Here are my stresses. I give them to you. Lord, I need your peace. I need your presence. Touch me with your spirit. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Can, can you leave those prayers there? Uh, so some of you know this, and uh, some of you may not, but I, I know a little something personally about worry and anxiety. Uh, when I was in about sixth grade, I was diagnosed with over-anxious disorder. And, uh, and I suffered all kinds of physical symptoms that were worry-related. So I had panic attacks, I had migraine headaches, I had spastic colon, I had night terrors. I mean, I was a wreck of, of anxiety. Um, but this is what I've learned. 
This is what I've learned. First of all, I've learned this. Uh, things are not always going to work out the way that you want them to. I don't care how many times you pray to God. I'm not, I don't care how many times you fill up a worry jar. Things are not going to work out exactly the way you want them to. That's not how God works. Uh, God's not a genie. Um, but here's the thing I do know. Things do work out. I, don't ask me how. Things work out. There's a great scripture from Jeremiah 29 that says this. Surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. To give you a future with a hope, right? Uh, I also know this. No matter how many times uh, I flirted with losing hope, no, how many, no matter how many times I found myself in despair or lost in worry and anxiety, God always made a way where I saw no way. God always did. I, again, I can't, can't explain it to you. And through the years, I have grown in my trust of God. And I'm not going to tell you I never worry or that I don't ever kind of like get myself worked up about things every once in a while. Uh, but I have grown in my trust of God enough uh, that I don't experience the, the same level of anxiety and worry that just used to cripple me. And that's what the disciples learned that first Easter. They learned to trust God more deeply than they ever had before. They were locked up in that room. They were afraid to go out because they were afraid of what might happen to them. They thought their worst fears had come true. They thought that Jesus was dead and they thought that they were next. But then suddenly Jesus was there in their midst saying, peace be with you. He was alive. Uh, and the disciples' fears and worries did not have the final word. And here's the thing. If we'll put our faith in Christ and through our faith in Christ, our fears and our worries don't have to have the last word either. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you enable us to do and to be more than we can think or imagine. Help us to lay aside our worries and our anxieties and to believe that you are a God who blesses us in and through our struggles and that you will make a way when we see no way. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I encourage you to remember Jesus' words to his disciples when they were locked in that room in fear. Peace be with you. And I offer you these words of peace as our blessing. Deep peace of the running waves to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of Christ, the light of the world to you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.